So in addition to writing several books, Kyle is uh, also a columnist for Linux Journal and has been featured in several other publications. He's also a senior system administrator for Quinn Street, and he's the current president of the North Bay Linux Users Group. Please welcome Kyle Rankin. Hello. Okay, so um, my name's Kyle Rankin, and I've been uh, actually using Nopix for quite some time. Um, started off when I was um, trying to look for a nice live demo CD to um, introduce people to Linux, and then um, saw a lot of the recovery abilities that it had, and so I started using it regularly, um, and then eventually um, wrote a couple books about it and a, a, a bunch of articles. Um, but today I'm going to focus in on a pretty specific thing, um, how to remaster Nopix without actually going through the remastering process. So here's pretty much the agenda for today. So for, first I'm going to cover um, traditional remastering. What does that look like and some of the downsides to that. And then because of that, why you may want to remaster, why you want to remaster without remastering. What does that mean? Uh, why you may want to do that. Um, then I'm going to cover um, a couple different methods you can use. There's not just one. Um, one of them is the uh, persistence features that Nopix has built in and has for some time. Um, talk about how to use the save configuration and tweak and the persistent disk image, um, all ways to do that. Um, then I'm going to cover how to change the actual boot settings as Nopix boots. That's another common thing you may want to do when you remaster. Um, then how to um, tweak the initRD, the initial root um, disk that the kernel uses and what you can do with that. Finally, I'll finish up with uh, how to use custom boot scripts to change um, what Nopix does at boot and then follow up with a, an example where I turn Nopix into a webcam. Um, with very minimal code. So first, it's worth talking about what Nopix actually is, um, in case you're not, um, you've never used Nopix before. So basically what it is is a complete Linux distribution that runs entirely off of the CD or DVD in these days. But there's a lot of different things you can do with it. There's a lot of different software included on the disk. It's, it's very general purpose. So among the things you can do with it, is that you can use it to demonstrate Linux. Um, you can use it as a portable Linux distribution, and that's actually how it was created, was the idea was to have a CD that had all of the Linux tools that Klaus Knopper needed and be able to take those tools um, from computer to computer to computer um, and have them all at his disposal without worrying about losing a laptop or losing a desktop or anything like that. So um, another thing you can use, use it for is to install Linux. This was particularly popular um, back before Debian and Ubuntu came along with better installers. A lot of people would use Nopix because it was the easiest way at the time to get a Debian system up and running. Um, you can use it a lot for system administration. I use it a lot for that and as a rescue disk. It's a great tool for um, rescue. Um, a lot of people use it for live CD creation also, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit. Um, a lot of people use Nopix as the, as the launching off point. Um, a couple hundred people have used that actually. Um, to create their own Nopix-based live CDs, and they've gone through the full remastering process to do that, and there's tons of other uses for it. Um, now, a traditional remastering um, process, basically what you do is you copy the entire Nopix file system to the disk. Um, when Nopix boots, it, it has its entire file system in this um, compressed loopback file. It um, mounts that, you have to mount that and then copy the entire contents. So for a CD-ROM, that's about it ends up being about two gigabytes um, uncompressed. For a, the DVD, it ends up being around 10 gigabytes. Um, you copy that um, somewhere to a file system, a hard drive somewhere. Um, then after that, you ch root into that file system, and then you perform any changes. So for example, you can add and remove packages. Um, you can change configuration files. A lot of times, what what happens when someone uses Nopix over time? to say, this is really great, but if only it had this one extra tool, especially for the CD-ROM, because there's only so much that can fit on there. They've had to make some choices and sacrifices. So a lot of people use it, and they say, if I could only have this one or two extra things on there, or if it only did this at boot time, it would be great and serve all my needs. And so they take it, and they add or remove the packages that they need, um, and it basically acts like any other Debian system. You can run apt-get and remove packages for, or add packages. After that, the, you, the next process is you would exit the ch root environment. Then um, you go through a series of um, really long command line arguments uh, to create a compressed loopback file system. And, at, and that takes, depending on the disk, about a half an hour, and depending on the computer, to do. Then you create um, an ISO out of that compressed, with that compressed file system and the rest of the files that um, make up the Nopix CD. 
Um, then you can test it either on the disk or you can burn it to a, a CD and try it out. Um, but there's a lot of problems with that process. Hundreds of, people, hundreds of people have done it and released their disks out to the public, and many more have tried it on their own and either didn't release it because it was just for personal use or because it was really hard to get working. Um, there's a lot of problems with traditional remastering. First, it's time consuming. Every time you want to do this, it takes um, X amount of time to just copy all of the files over to a hard drive. Um, it takes a lot of time to actually compress that into a loopback file system. It takes a lot of time to then make an ISO and test, reboot and test it and make sure everything works. And then um, it's really complex. There's a lot that you could, um, there's a lot of mistakes you can make because Nopix does a, a number of interesting things at boot time that a lot of other Linux distributions don't. There's a lot of um, hardware detection that goes on. There's a lot of different things that you wouldn't normally find in a, in a everyday install to disk Linux distribution that Nopix does. So it can be complex when you're trying to change that. Um, the interactions between your changes and the actual Nopix disk sometimes are unpredictable. There's, so there's a lot of trial and error involved when you end up remastering Nopix. Uh, all the times I've done it, it's been a matter of I make one change, create the file system, do everything. You know, An hour later, I actually can test it. Oh, I made this one little typo. Then I have to go back and do it all over again because it's not, there's no easy way to really just make one little tweak. You have to go through the whole process. Um, there's, spa there's space limitations. Like I said, the CD, um, even though it compresses down to about 700 megs, um, when it's decompressed, you have to have at least two gigs to store just the, uh, one copy of the file system. Um, extra space, you end up needing about four gigs of space to store the entire thing when you're all said and done. Um, and the DVD is even worse. Like I said, you need 10 gigs just to start um, to copy the file system over, and you really need more like 15 or 20. Um, nowadays, it's not as huge of a deal as it used to be, but still, that's a lot of space you have to give up on your system just to do a remastering. It's also difficult to keep up to date. So Nopix used to be a really fast-moving target. There would be releases every, every couple months. Um, now it's not quite that way. We've had the last couple of years, it's been one release a year, more or less. But all the same, um, what ends up happening is you see so many forks off of Nopix because people will make an initial change. They change a couple things, even if they do a sort of a, a big change. Um, they do that, and then a couple months later, a year later, Nopix releases another version. Well, now they have to figure out how to either um, upgrade all of their changes, remember all their changes, and then adapt them to the new Nopix version, and then have to deal with all that. Or what a lot of people do is they end up just sticking with whatever version they have, and end up forking further and further and further off of the mainline Nopix. That's okay, but it, you know there's a lot of benefits that um, Clouds ends up adding each year that you end up missing out on. So I've seen some projects they end up, you know, finally they scrap it and then start over again and add their their changes. Or other ones like Morphix have created their own separate distribution where they sort of stay in line and they sort of don't. Like Cluster Nopix is a good example of one that I think is still today running Nopix 3.6, which is about three or four or five years old now. Okay, live CD sprawl. There, like I said, there are hundreds of live CDs out there that are Nopix based and a lot of them just do a couple different changes. There's like five or six that are the security live CD. So they have all of this, the same security tools on all of them. A couple different tweaks. Somebody uses Fluxbox instead of KDE or something um, as the desktop environment. But other than that, they're pretty similar. So if you're using them as a, if you're a system in, say, and you use Nopix for more than just one reason, or use a live CD, you find yourself carrying around like five or six different live CDs, each for the specific purpose. Even though Nopix, for the most part, can do most of the purposes, and with a couple tweaks, it could do the rest. So. What I advocate, and what I've been doing, especially recently, is um, remastering Nopix without actually going through that time-consuming process. So what do I mean when I say the remaster without remastering? Basically, what I mean is changing Nopix's behavior, changing its configuration files, et cetera, without actually touching the Nopix um, loopback file system. So that's the big, um, on a CD, it's about 700 meg file called Nopix in all uppercase that sits on the CD and that it decompresses and, and mounts it loopback, and that's how it accesses all the files. When you start getting in and mucking with that file, you start running into all the trouble I said before. But there's a lot of ways you can tweak what Nopix does without touching that file, period. And that's what I'm talking about. It's a lot faster. Most of these changes are, um, take only a couple minutes to, to do and then a couple minutes to try out. It's a lot faster process. So, and it's simpler. So there's less, you're less likely to make a mistake. And even if you do, because it's faster, um, there's still trial and error involved with any of this, but you can, the iterations are much, much faster um, when you do it without going through the full process. 
Plus, you can just carry one disk around. Most of these um, remastering processes um, can be stored on a separate USB drive. If you want to burn it onto a DVD, you can do that if you want. Um, but still, the idea behind this is instead of having five different or six different um, live CDs that you carry around all the time, you just have one Nopix CD. And then your USB key with all of the different types, distributions you've made that's forked off of it. The other nice thing is that, do I talk about this? Um, when you upgrade, with Nopix upgrades rather, a lot of times, depending on what changes you made, it's a lot easier for them to be ported into the new Nopix because you're not actually changing the, live, the actual file system. You're making changes in addition to that. It's a lot easier to gauge the space. Um, one of the problems when you do a remastering is that it's hard to predict how well it will be compressed. So a lot of times, and um, Klaus does a lot of interesting things on his side to optimize space. Like he'll go through and delete unnecessary man pages, and he'll do a lot of other things to free up space that you may not remember to do um, when you're doing a remastering. So what will happen is you'll go through all this work. You think you've deleted tons of files. You've like, removed Emacs, which is one of the bigger ones on the CD. Um, you've removed that, and you have plenty of free space, you think. And then you, then you compress everything. You have it up, up and running, and then it's like 740 megs now. So it won't fit on your regular CD. You can either decide to expand it or you, know, you have a couple options. But, so then you have to go back in, shrink it down again. With this, since you're not dealing with the compressed file system, you know that, say you know that I have 20 megs to play with, give or take. I know that whatever I do, I can see right now whether it takes 20 megs, and I don't have to wait for the compressed loopback file system to kick in. Um, and then with a DVD, the actual Nopix DVD has a lot of free space on it already. Um, so there's a lot of wiggle room if you want to do um, something based off of Nopix. If you use the DVD, you can fit a lot of extra things on the DVD. And then, of course, if you use a USB key, it doesn't matter. That's the size of whatever your USB drive is. You can just fit everything on there. It's a lot easier to update and migrate because a lot of times um, what, what these scripts will end up being is just a, a number of settings, maybe a, a shell script or two that you're running that install packages. Um, it's a lot easier to upgrade um, because if Nopix comes up with a new release and there happens to be a new package for you to use, you can just replace that one package file and your script more or less can remain the same. So it's a lot easier than having to go back into the file system and make a change every time Nopix updates. So now I'm going to talk about a couple of the different ways you can do this, probably starting from easiest to most difficult, but again, all of these are relatively easy. Um, but the first one, first method to remaster is called is the save configuration script. Um, it's actually a really classic Nopix script. It's existed as, I can't even remember when it didn't exist, but it's been at least since like the three O's series, if not before that. Um, basically, the script is run by typing save config, or there's the, if you want to click through, you can click through and get it. Although I noticed actually that on the very latest 5.3.1 that just came out this month, that the, you, the script existed, but the menu wasn't there anymore. Um, I don't know if that was intentional, if they're deprecating it, or if it, it was just a mistake. Well, I guess I will find out either on the CD release or the next release. Um, basically, what it does is it pops up when you run this. It pops up a little GUI on your desktop, or actually, if you run it in the on the terminal in a terminal without a uh, GUI, it pr provides this little incursive interface, and it allows you to save um, a couple. You can choose what to save, but you can save personal configurations. So, say you make a like all of your .dot files um, and all the .dot directories that you create any save, um, settings you've changed in Firefox or anything like that, you can tell it to save that. Um, you can tell it to save all the files on the desktop. So say you're working on something and you want to um, resume later. You can save all the files on the desktop, um, all of your network settings. This was actually way more important in the past when it used to be a real big pain to get, like especially wireless cards working on a network. And you, sometimes you had to go through a certain level of kung fu to get everything working. You had it working great. And then you reboot Nopix, and all that work is gone, and you have to do it again. So this kicked in so that you could save all of that work and then apply it later. Um, graphic settings. Again, this is, some of these were more important in the past when a lot of the auto detection wasn't where it is now. But a lot of times, you had to jump through a ton of ho hoops to get X up and running on your particular video card. So that what it would basically do is, is uh, back up all of your X settings, and then so it could reapply them later. And then other settings. So the idea is anything you may have had to do a lot of work to do that Nopix could automatically do, like um, printers and peripherals, that sort of thing, um, this script can save all of those files for you so you can resume later. Basically how it works is um, it creates a file called configs.tbz. It's a compressed, bzipped um, tarball. 
um, on your shows and media. When you run the script, it actually will detect any potential media it could store this on. So if you inject in, um, put in a USB key, it will detect that. If you have a hard drive on the system with partitions, it will find those and list those. You choose which one you want to use, and then um, it actually will create this file on that media. It also creates um, a file called nopics.sh. What that is is essentially just a shell script. There's a, a little bit of logic in the beginning, but essentially all it does is um, untar um, that tarball. Um, then at boot, what you can do is there's a little cheat code you can use at the boot prompt when you boot Nopix that says my config equals, in, in this case, dev SDA1, if that's the device of your USB drive. Um, and then it will go through and boot that. Or you could say my config equals scan. And then Nopix will actually scan all available media for the um, Nopix SH script and then run it if it finds it. One of the under, other interesting things about this is you can actually store multiple configurations um, in nested directories on a USB key, for instance. So say you make one that's, this is my security one. I have all of my security configurations saved here. This is one I use for my network configuration at home, and here's one for work or wherever. You can save those in nested directories, and then in the my config, you just list the directory structure underneath dev sda1 you know, slash sysadmin, and then it will look there. Um, so at boot, you can actually toggle between the different configurations. Um, Nopix actually executes this at the very end of the boot process. So if you watch it boot, it'll get all the way to right before it starts um, X, and then it will run the script. So if you're trying to think of when you want to start doing things to Nopix, at this point, most the network is generally up at this point. Um, all the file systems that are going to be mounted have been mounted. Um, all the drivers have been loaded. So um, if that applies to what you're trying to change, then um, it boots it at the end, so this is a good place to do a lot of changes. Uh, oh, I, I said this before, but you can store different configs in different directories, so this is how you would do that. I've used that in the past, especially when it was really difficult to install new software on, a live, on Nopix Live. I would go through all the work of setting it all up and installing everything and then save it to different directories so I could, didn't have to go through the work again. Now it's a little bit easier. Um, now, one of the ways you can use this to remaster, one of the best ways to use this to remaster is to tweak it beyond what it normally can do. So by default, it can save all of your dot files and some pretty basic things. Um, but you may decide that you want it to save not all your dot files, but just a couple. Or you know, not every file on your desktop, but just a few. So what you can do is, um, one way is you can start, you can go ahead and go through the process of creating one, uh, a config and Nopix SH file. You can ex then you can extract the, um, the tarball into a temporary directory, um, wherever you want to do it, modify it, you know, change some of the files, delete some of the files from that directory, and then recreate it. Or, or if you want, um, even another way to do it is you can actually create your own config TBZ. Um, you can either look in the config, to, uh, the script to find out how Nopix creates it, or you can just run this command, which is how they create it. Basically, um, type this command in, and then at the, at the end, the argument is um, your directory structure. So in this case, all I'm backing up is uh, Mozilla, my Mozilla config. Uh, but you can add, you know, it's just a tar command, so you can add whatever directories you want to add, or specifically you can exclude a lot of directories. So you don't, if you have a limited space, you don't have to bother with that. In addition, say you have a config that you've already set up, and then you decide, well, it'd be really nice if I could add some files to this um, after I've used it for a little bit. Well, to add files, basically you unzip, use bnzip2 to unzip the tarball. Then use tar, a tar command with the dash r option to um, add whatever files you want to add to it. Pretty general use of tar. Like I said, there's not a whole lot of magic here. This is all pretty standard Linux command line stuff that he's doing, so he's not trying to do anything too crazy. Um, to delete files, similar process. You unzip it, and then you use the tar delete command to delete those particular files from the system. Then you just have to recompress the tarball and then rename it so that it looks the same to the Nopix script, and then you're done. Now, that's probably the oldest um, remastering Nopix without remastering script that they, put, they, they came out with. There's another one, there's another method that they have um, that they call persistent disk image. Um, this is actually a pretty old script too. It used to be called make persistent home, um, and there's the really long command name for it. Uh, what it essentially did was it created a loopback file system on some sort of media like USB key or a hard drive, um, and then uh, copied your entire home directory over to it. So you would say, I want a 64 meg persistent disk image, or back when that was a huge USB key, I want a 30 meg US, you know, persistent disk image. 
it would create a loopback file system, mount it, and then rsync everything over from your home directory um, onto this image. Well, then what it would do is at boot time, it would mount that and then replace your regular home directory with this uh, USB key. And the idea is if you change anything on your desktop, any of your settings, all of that stuff gets copied over. When you boot, it now accesses this home directory and all of your settings have, are persistent. Any change you make right now, when you stop Nopix and reboot, it automatically gets saved and then, then it gets unmounted. Um, and then next time you boot, it's right back where you left it. With the, with the, um, the save configuration from before, it only updates whenever you run the script or whenever you update the tarball. This, with this method, whenever the, the persistent disk image is mounted, any changes are always being made to it. Now, this is the old way to do it. They changed what it did um, because of AUFS, or also Union, when UnionFS came into play, which I'm going to talk about here now. Um, it totally changed how this, how this was used because AUFS totally changed how Nopix was used, period. It opened up whole new dimensions of how you can use Nopix. So a little background on UnionFS first. Um, it was created in 2004, so it's relatively new technology. Uh, what it lets you do is essentially merge file systems on top of each other um, relatively transparently to the user. Um, so one of the, one of the major applications at first was NFS. So say you have a couple of um, NFS servers that you're using for um, home directories. One of, the, one of the problems may be trying to get all of those, if you run out of storage, you may end up spanning that across multiple file systems or multiple computers. And then you have to worry about, well, if a user logs in, how do I make sure that, they're, that the NFS mount that they get has their home directory on it? Well, um, with UnionFS, you can just merge four, five, six, however many NFS shares you want all on top of each other into your home directory. And then if you have A through M on this server and N through Z on this server, they both, to the user, appear to be one consistent unified file system. Um, you can even use it to merge read-only and read-write file systems on top of each other. And because of that capability, that's where Nopix came in. Oh, and here's the URL for it if you want more details about the project. Um, Nopix started incorporating this, um, started with three, Nopix 3.8, so at this point that's probably two and a half, maybe three years ago, and they started um, using the technology. Um, basically what they decided to do is, they've always had a RAM disk, and it's always been a place for the home directory has been stored on RAM disk. Some of the Etsy has been symlinked over to the RAM disk. Um, so you can change some, uh, some essential settings about the system and you can write to your home directory. But certain really important parts of the file system, like the user directory, um, were read-only. Because it's a live CD. You're running off a CD. What are you going to do? Um, what they did, so you couldn't actually ever install new programs on Nopix. You had to go through this hacky method of installing them to your home directory in this weird place, adding that directory to your path. And then you could sort of use them, but some of them would link against other libraries under users. So if you wanted to, you could hack the binary and change the location, do all kinds of messed up things to your system. What they did instead was they just take the RAM disk, um, allocate however much they can, mount it on top of the root, um, and merge the read-only and read-write file systems on top of each other. So basically what, what that means is you can now write anywhere on the live CD. You can treat it like an installed Linux distribution. And, not, and UnionFS or AUFS now will figure out what to do. So if you decide to do a write, it, does, it puts the write um, into the read-write file system. If, um, and then when you do a read later on, if that file exists on the read-write file system, it gets precedence. Or if it doesn't, then it goes through and gets the read-only file. So that way, like I said, you can run apt-get, um, aptitude synaptic, any package manager you want. If you want to install NVIDIA drivers or something, which aren't included by default, just um, download those and follow, follow their how-to. You can treat it like a normal Linux distribution. You're basically just limited by how much RAM disk you have on the system. Obviously, if you only have one gig of RAM on the system and you try to install three gigs of files, it's not going to work. But that's pretty much the only limitation to it. Later on, um, AUFS was replaced, uh, or UnionFS was replaced by AUFS, which stands for another UnionFS because we like recursive acronyms. Uh, and you can go to aufs.sourceforge.net to find out more about that. But that's what they replaced it with, I would say, sometime maybe in the 5 Series, beginning of the 5 Series, if not the late 4 Series, they did that. Because of, because of UnionFS and the fact that you can merge these file systems, um, the persistent disk image changed. So now they call it Nopix Make Image, and they actually say, instead of persistent home directory, they say persistent Nopix disk image. Essentially what happens when you run the script is you get a GUI that pops up, and ask you how big you want to make the loopback file system. But what it does is it makes a complete copy of the RAM disk now. So that includes 
um, any writes that you've made to the system, any changes, period, now get copied to this. Um, so if you live install something and install, installed under user, um, bin, whatever, that gets copied to this RAM disk now. If you want, um, it actually, actually will prompt you if you want to encrypt it with AES-256 encryption. You can generate a pass key on the fly there and encrypt the entire volume if you um, want that extra level of security. Um, and you don't even have to use a cheat code anymore for this. What happens is if you have any disk inserted that happens to have this persistent disk image available, when Nopix boots, it automatically scans and detects the, those. And then it presents you with a couple of options. So the first option, there's a couple that you can toggle through. You can select one or more of these options. First one is home. Essentially, what the, if you select that, um, only the home portion of the RAM disk will be mounted on and used by Nopix. So say you've saved all kinds of things. You've installed programs, but you only want to use your home directory settings right now. Toggle this, and only those will be applied. Um, if you toggle system, Essentially what happens is instead of using a RAM disk at all, it actually will mount that entire um, file system using your loopback file system. So that means everything gets applied, period. Etsy settings, um, any programs you've installed, your home directory, everything gets applied. Um, if you tell it to overwrite, this is off by default, and you'll see why in a minute. If you tell it to overwrite, what it basically does is it will replace the Etsy on your loopback file system. Um, it will replace it with whatever it currently has. Uh, as it's booted. Now, the reason you'd want to do this is, say, for example, you booted Nopix on a, a system with a particular set of hardware and with a particular video card and the resolution of 1280 by um, 768, for instance, widescreen. And then you move it to a system that doesn't have those settings, that it can maybe only like an EPC or something that can only do 800 by 600. You boot Nopix off of it. Um, the X settings, if you use a persistent home, the old X settings are going to try to apply, even though Nopix by, at boot time auto detects all these settings and applies them for you. So if you check this option, what it will do is it will basically overwrite all of your Etsy settings that you used to have with the new ones for the system. So you may want, if you, you may want to use this if you're moving from one system to another. And then finally, init. Basically what that will do is if you set up any new programs especially, or you've changed the knit scripts, added in a knit scripts, it'll actually execute those for you. And here's a cheat code. If you, um, if, even though it automatically detects this at boot, um, you may, again, want to store multiple versions of different persistent disk images on a USB drive um, to have that flexibility. You can do that. Again, you can nest the, the directories down so you can have all kinds of different nopix.img files on your system. And, what will happen is Nopix will, with this cheat code, will look in that directory for that Nopix.img file. So that's another, again, pretty easy um, to use method to customize things because you can just run a script, um, go through a couple, you know, toggle a couple, click a couple next buttons, and then all of your settings are copied over. Um, but you can also tweak the boot settings on the CD. Now, the first two steps um, typically you use on a USB key, so you keep that separately. But these settings you can actually um, apply to the, the CD or the DVD image itself. Um, so you make a copy of it and make these settings and then burn a new CD or DVD with these new settings so they're actually embedded on the CD or DVD. Um, and you can tweak a lot of boot settings and a lot of Nopix settings without actually going in and messing with that loopback file system. So if you do want to create a customized Nopix that you're passing out to people so it's all self-contained on a CD and you don't have to pass out a DVD to them, you can make some of these changes and burn the new, new disk and pass it out and you don't have to worry about, well, here's this, but you also have this USB key. Again, what we're trying to always do is avoid going through the whole remastering process because for all those reasons, it's really annoying and you don't need to do it. So first, if you go to the boot ISO Linux directory on the Nopix CD itself, like if you just slap it into a regular computer, look at the disk, you'll see this directory. Um, basically, it's, if you've ever used SysLinux, Pixie Linux, ISO Linux before, it's basically just a, meth, um, a bootloader in a sense. Um, there's an ISO Linux CFG file that's the main configuration file for this. Within this file, you can, basically, you can do a lot of things. You can change the default cheat codes that Nopix uses. Um, where, where that's really useful is a lot of times, every year he releases the German-only version of the CD, of the DVD at, at, at the CBIT conference. And then everyone's like, well, this is great, but it defaults to German, and I don't speak German. so. I have to type in lang equals en every time I boot the, boot the disk so that it defaults to English instead. Well, what you can do here is you can actually go into that file, edit this file, and tell it don't default to, to German, default to English. Or any other new cheat codes you want to add, you can add to this file. 
Um, you can change the boot timeout. Say you don't like that Nopix only gives you 30 seconds before it boots, or say you don't want any timeout. You want it to just stay on the screen forever. Um, you can tweak that. You can add new boot images. So by default, it includes some extras like Memtest86 and a couple things like that. But say you have new other boot images you want to add that um, ISO Linux can boot, which there are plenty. Um, like for example, some of the uh, like Ubuntu's installer, that sort of thing. You could actually add that if you wanted to. Um, you can also tweak the boot messages that appear. So say you want to create a customized Nopix, but you don't want to say Nopix all over the place. You want to call it you know, Kylix or something like that. I think one of those exists. Uh, you can go to the boot MSG or F2 and F3, et cetera. There's other files that are there that have just messages that appear when you press those particular keys. Um, you can go through and change. It's just a text file, essentially. With it. Sometimes they, there's a little bit of like um, uh, ANSI escape sequences to do colors. But other than that, it's pretty much a text file. You can go through and change all occurrences of Nopix to Kylix or whatever you want to call it if you want, or add other instructions. You can even add, say, F4. So when you and tweak the ISO Linux config to say when you hit F4, here's extra documentation I provided that tells you extra stuff I've done. Um, another thing you can do is tweak the initrd. This is a little um, heavier duty, I guess, than, than editing the ISO Linux configs because you actually are dealing with the, the root disk that um, Linux uses by default. There's a lot of um, pretty um, serious scripts that Nopix uses at, at boot that set, you know, do hard, does hardware settings and does a lot of other settings. But if you want to remaster, um, if you're willing to go through all those steps, you can actually do a lot of that, again, without going into that loopback file system. So basically all you do, do is, here's the initrd, here's where it's located. Uh, mini rt.gz is what it is. You basically copy it to your, local, your current directory. You unzip it. And then at that point, make a temp directory. And it's a loopback file system, essentially. It's an ext2 loopback file system. So you just mount it loopback. And once you mount it, um, then you can go in and edit a lot of the files. Some of, some of them are less interesting than others. Um, the most interesting one is probably, probably the Linux RC file. Um, that's essentially the init script that Nopix um, first boots before it does anything else. So if there's certain settings you want, if there's certain changes you want to make that will apply before anything else happens, including before it loads SCSI drivers, before it loads any drivers, for that matter, um, you can actually edit this file. You can add brand new cheat codes that start at the very beginning of the boot process. You can change default Nopix paths because Nopix will, by default, look for go into the slash Nopix directory, then look under there for all these other boot files. You can change all that stuff within this um, file. When you're done, unmount the temp directory, um, gzip it again, and then at that point, you have the same file. You just copy it back over the top of the other file, burn a new CD, and you're set. So um, another thing you can do is you can actually create custom boot scripts. Um, this is a little play on the save config um, script I told you about before. Um, basically, what will happen is if you have a nopix.sh file in the uppercase nopix directory on the CD, so there's just a big uppercase nopix directory there, if you put a nopix.sh file in there, it will always execute it every time it boots, if, it, if that file is present. Um, so what you can do is if you wanted to copy um, and it executes like with save config at the very end of the boot process. So what you can do um, is basically put anything you want in there. But if you wanted to just copy a save config that you liked a lot and you want to always work, always apply, you can just copy both of those files into the Nopix directory. And every time you boot, it will apply those files. Um, it's just a shell script. There's no magic here. So if you want to, you can just write any shell script that you can think of, um, plop it in here, name it Nopix.sh, and every time you boot, it will be executed. So, What's possible? Well, for instance, um, you can add Debs, um, you know, Debian packages to the CD in the Nopix directory. And then in the script, write dpackage-i to install them. So if there's a program you want Nopix to have that it doesn't have by default, you can make sure every time you boot, it actually adds it. At boot time, it just goes ahead and installs it here. Um, you can, there's, a lot, there's a ton of um, programs on Nopix, like Apache, um, MySQL, a lot of other programs that are installed, but don't um, start it um, by default, like SSH, one of the common ones. I actually um, personally use, or at work, I use Nopix as a net booted rescue disk. So if I have any servers that, are in, that I need to rescue, instead of going running around with a CD all the time, all my servers can net boot. And I have a Kickstart server set up to, um, boot lo to you know, install them. So I just added Nopix to that um, as an option when I'm kickstarting. So now I can boot any machine off the network and boot Nopix. Well, that's great, but by default, it doesn't run SSH. 
So I have this booted system, but then I have to go through like a, you know, either a serial console of some sort or something like that to access it. With this, I can just start up SSH, see what lease it got, what its IP address is, and then SSH into it from any terminal I want to use. Um, really, you can do anything. It's more or less limited by your ability to script. So, and again, it's just a shell script. So you can run any commands more or less you want, and you're, you're only limited by the things that you couldn't do from a terminal in Nopix anyway. Um, but anything else you can more or less do. So, pretty good example of this. This is a pretty basic, and I set this up actually with a netbooted Nopix, but it would work on a CD too. I basically turned Nopix into a, a little webcam server for me. Um, pretty basic. First thing I do, um, I'll get my, there we go. Um, I copy, I, had a, I put a little index.html file, just very basic web page, um, on the CD ROM and copied it to the default doc root for Apache on Nopix. Then I start Apache. Then I add like a little cron job that uses GQCam, which is a webcam um, screen grabber, and dump a webcam.jpg, tell it to, to every minute, essentially, it will run this program, grab a screen, a screen capture from the webcam, then dump it into this directory. I set up this web page so that it automatically, um, this, it basically just says, welcome to the webcam, or some basic stuff, and then shows that image. Um, and then do like a really cheap refresh, auto refresh every minute. Um, so then I do this into the cron tab, and then I start cron, which isn't started by default. And that's all there is to it. At this point, all I had to do was take a laptop or anything really that, and then the webcam that I knew Linux worked with Linux, plug it in, aim it where I want to aim it, and then boot Nopix with this um, Nopix SH script on it, and it turns it in instantly into a webcam. Save that hardware dies, and I need to do something else with it. I can unplug the webcam, take Nopix out, um, and then get a new laptop or something else and hook it all up again and boot again. And what I, like I said, you can do this on the CD. What I did was booted it over the network. So then any machine I wanted to, I could boot over the network, um, point to this particular instance of Nopix, and then it would instantly be a webcam for me. Actually, I at least temporarily set this up as a, at work to, um, we have a problem where, I don't know if you have the problem here, but we have really clean bathrooms. Um, the downside to really clean bathrooms is someone's routinely cleaning them to keep them that way. Well, it's always, you know, in the male bathrooms at least, we have, the, we have a female that cleans them. So there's a sign that comes up and the bathroom's closed. So it's always closed right when you need to go. Um, so you, you walk all the way over there, then you have to go all the way back. Well, I thought, well, it'd be really nice. They put the sign out in the hallway. If I could aim a webcam just down that hallway, I could go to, from my desk, I could see, is it open, is it closed? And then I wouldn't go. So set this up, and then you know, I could just go to the, we call it the can cam, um, but we could go to that website internally and just see whether or not there's anyone cleaning it. And it, this took me you know, like maybe 15 minutes to set up, start to finish. There was not a whole lot to it. Um, that's pretty much the end. There's a lot of other resources. So there's the official Nopix website, of course, at nopix.org. Um, be sure to use the www. They actually, nopix.org goes somewhere else, actually, no, so it won't load. Um, there's an unofficial Nopix forum. At least there's a lot of different ones, but this is the, the English-speaking one. Um, they have a lot, of, a lot of great people on the forum itself, and, a lot, and they have a really good wiki that has a lot of um, documentation. Um, then a, a shameless plug for my book, uh, Nopix Hack Second Edition. I have a co couple copies up here you can um, thumb through. Um, there's also a pocket reference. Um, so it has a lot of the essential stuff you need to know that I talk about here, but in, you know, in your pocket. And then this talk, um, which is going to live here perpetually. So you can flip through if you're interested in some of the command line options I used. But other than that, now I'm opening it up for questions, if there are any. Well, OK. Thank you very much.